Hello guys. In this video I'm going to be building this Spitfire and BF109 from Beacon Models and combining it with the C terrain which I made in my last video. If you haven't seen these kits before, I did a review of them in a recent video. They are 1 to 1 4 4 scale, which makes them perfect for little dioramas like this. And as you can see from the box here, we have one Spitfire Mark 1A, so a very early Spitfire, and a BF 109E4. As you would expect, the Spitfire is wearing the temperate land scheme of dark earth and dark green, and the 109 is wearing the early war RLM 70, 71 and 02 scheme, with RLM 65 undersides. Now the small scale of these kits might be great for dioramas, but it does make things a bit more difficult when making videos, so please do forgive me if my finger gets in the way or my focus gets lost for a moment, because these pieces are absolutely tiny. So I showed the instructions in my previous video, but as you can see, the construction is relatively straightforward. We've got a couple of pieces for the cockpit, which goes into the fuselage half. And then the second fuselage half joins that. The wings are a single piece with the upper and lower all molded on together. And then we have the elevators and a few other bits and pieces for details. So here's the first half of the Spitfire. And I thought with details this small, I didn't really want to be painting things before gluing. So I put the instrument panel into place. The kits don't come with any figures. However, the Kickstarter supporters did receive this 3D printed set of figures. There are four figures in total, two German, two British, and each has one standing pilot and one sitting pilot. Because they are so small, the easiest way I found to differentiate them was to look at the seats they're sitting in and compare those with the empty seats in the kits. So you can see here, for example, the one closest to the camera is the 109 pilot, and the one at the rear there is the Spitfire pilot. You can see that these 3D printed parts are a perfect fit, a perfect replacement for the kit parts. So here's the 109 pilot in his seat. That slots nicely into that fuselage there, just as the kit part would do. And I do believe that Beacon Models will be selling the STLs of these models um, for customers uh, shortly. So you can buy those and print them yourself, and I believe they're also licensing them for other people to print if you don't have a printer. Despite me making it look difficult, the kit instrument panel does fit easily there into that 3D printed part. Here you can see a comparison between the two. So this is the injection molded empty seat that you get with the kit. And if we just put this side by side, there is the 3D printed occupied seats. So good stuff there from Beacon. The approach I went for here was to paint everything, the entire inside of the fuselage, and also the pilots and their seat in the interior color. So um, that's the cockpit green for the Spitfire. This is Tamiya XF-71. and the RLM-02 for the um, 109 Pilot. The idea here was to get a base coat on everything and then I can start to pick out the details with a different colour. But I won't have to worry about there being bare plastic visible. And I think on such a small scale like this, that's quite a useful thing to do. Now I know this blue is a bit too dark for our RIF Pilot, but uh, it's the nearest one I had. It will dry matte, it's just a bit wet at the moment, so that paint. I didn't have anything that was sufficiently blue-grey um, to do that, and I wasn't going to buy a pot of paint for a, uh, a 144th scale figure. Here is now some boots and some uh, fly mask on, and I'm trying here to paint the um, goggles. Now bear in mind, of course, this is more than one-to-one -one magnification. This is bigger than it appears uh, you know, when I'm looking at it. I mean, you can see the ridges there in my fingernails. It's so hard to paint these. And then again, I made a bit of a slapdash mess of that, actually. That's supposed to be their life jacket, his life jacket there, um, in a sort of a, a beigey, light yellow colour. Difficult job painting these figures. They're going to be seen through glass as well. Um, but I think I've done, you know, I'm not unhappy with it. Here's our 109 pilot in his dark brown suit. Again, I've picked out the gloves. I've picked out his face here because it doesn't seem to be so covered. 
and um, also his um, obviously his uh, flying helmet. There we go. You can see some small layer lines there in the um, in the 3D print, but you know, imagine how small they are. Um, they're absolutely tiny. They're not visible with the naked eye uh, whatsoever. Here is our Spitfire cockpit. I know the um, the handle there of the control column shouldn't really be that colour. It should be black. But if I paint it black, it's going to blend in with the um, instrument panel. So I went for sort of a, a tan colour instead, just to make it stand out, really. Here's our 109 pilot, happily in his fuselage. It's quite interesting because I've built both the 124 scale Spitfire and the Airfix 148 scale 109 recently. And uh, you can definitely see where some of those details are, um, are carried across onto this small scale. Obviously a lot of them are lost, they have to be removed. Um, but there's definitely a correspondence there between those cockpits. The fuselage halves close up. Typically on these I don't remove those sprue nubs there when the halves are separate. I'd much rather get them together and then sand them off as one. And that gets a much smoother surface I find between the two. While the glue from that was drying, I added the underside details to the two aircraft. So they're both going to be in flight. B can supply two separate options, two separate pieces for wheels down or wheels up. So wheels up just drop into there very easily. We have the oil cooler here. Again, sorry, my finger is in the way. For super small parts like this, I like to use a bit of blue tack to hold them and then just sort of drop them off at their destination. A very similar thing there with the 109, and you'll notice the ejector pin marks there which are underneath the air intakes. So completely hidden once you put them in. That's a really useful touch given how small the detail is on this. You, know, you could end up sanding away an ejector pin mark and sanding away half the wing. Here's our 109 with a very out of focus shot of the wings going in. There we go. And the engine cowling. For the Spitfire things were fine, although I did notice that either I or the packaging managed to bend the um, the back piece there, the lower fuselage, so that had to be just held in place while the glue set up. As you can see there is a small amount of sanding that's needed. I've kind of fallen in love with these AK interactive sanding sticks, these really thin ones. They helped me a lot on the 124 scale Spitfire getting to those um, eject pin marks in the uh, ammunition bays. And they're really quite useful here too. Given the scale of the kit, I'm using quite a high grit um, sandpaper here. This is uh, 1200, I think. I'm just sort of gently trying to smooth out that uh, that joint line there. Here we have the last few details being added. I do like the way that this aerial is um, molded. So we've got that big chunk on the bottom there. That's going in the wrong way, so I need to turn that around the other way. The pure purpose of that big piece is to give it something to anchor onto inside the aircraft. So you put your glue on there, push it into place, and push it down until it goes flush. Hopefully, I don't want to tempt fate, but hopefully that will make it harder to break off that aerial. So that's the two kits all built except for the exhausts on the um, Spitfire, which I've kept separately, and of course the propellers on both. Now I spent quite a bit of time, and it wasn't too difficult, getting the masks here onto the canopies. I didn't show you that because it would just be a muddle of uh, fingers and thumbs, but uh, they're looking quite good. I've glued the canopies there on with some PVA glue. The canopy masks have these nice easy directions in the manual. The next step was to give everything a coat of Tamiya XF1 black. This was airbrushed on. Same for the 109 except I then gave it a not very well thinned looking at that shot. Um, 
set of white uh, wingtips and white rudder as the markings require. I'll mask off the important bit and then the rest of it will get painted over again. At this point I was working on how I would get these two aircraft um, airborne above my diorama. I figured the easiest way would be to use these uh, clear acrylic rods. These are 2mm diameter, so to achieve that I need to drill a hole in the bottom of the aircraft. The rods are not particularly sturdy, but you know these are super, super light. Here we can see the next round of painting with those wing tips and rudder masked off, and the RLM 65 on the 109, and the um, the RAF Sky on the Spitfire. The RLM 65 was from Vallejo Model Air. Spitfire's uh, sky color was from AK Real Colors. Then it was a case of just adding the successive colours, so RAF Dark Earth on the Spitfire, RLM 70 on the 109, both from AK Real Colours. Once those colours were dry it was time to mask for the camouflage patterns. I did notice that the instructions are almost exactly the same size as the, um, as the Spitfire itself, so I used that as a guide to help me. I find Tamiya masking sheets, rather than masking tape, to be really helpful in situations like this. A technique I like to use is to get some plastic, either a decal bag or something similar, to cut off a piece of the masking sheet, peel the backing off and stick it onto the plastic. Then it's usually transparent enough that you can trace through the pattern that you're looking for. At the very least you can get the general shape and you can cut that out with a pair of scissors later. Of course, this idea falls down when we come to the side because the diagram is far bigger than the actual Spitfire model. But after about an hour, I managed to get the Spitfire masked up, which was by far the most complicated of the two. The 109, of course, was much easier because it's got that splinter style uh, camouflage pattern. So it's just a case of looking where those lines go, putting them on with some thin Tamiya tape, and then filling in the gaps. The top colours were then added, so RAF Dark Green was again AK Real Colours. While the RLM 02 was from Vallejo Model Air. Unfortunately, I realized here that I missed out the uh, leading edges of the elevators, which should be in a light blue color on the 109, but that's okay. I managed to pull off the canopy of the 109 when I took the masking tape off, so that needs to be glued back on. It was then time for a small amount of detail painting, so the, uh, the weapons, what can be seen of the wheels on the underside, and the exhausts. Everything was then given a coat of gloss varnish in preparation for our decals. You can see that despite the small scale, we've got a good number of decals, including some stencils. These were applied, burnished with a cotton bud, and then made to adhere with some Tamiya Mark Fit.
It really is impressive how many decals are included in these kits. I messed up a little bit on this one because of course the stenciled line should go below the roundel. But that's okay, I could just cut it. But yes, lots and lots of detail here. Beautiful markings and serial number decals. The stencils for the wings. And those stencils have a nice sort of faded appearance. So they don't stick out like a sore thumb, which would be really easy for them to do on such a small scale model. Once the decals were sorted, it was time to add the last few details. So the exhaust on the Spitfire, the propellers on both, and then everything was given a coat of VMS matte varnish. I really like this varnish. It goes dead, dead matte. It gives a fantastic overall finish. Although I do find it dries quite quickly in the, uh, in the airbrush on the needle. So here's our 109, looking very nice indeed. Very happy with that so far. And here's our Spitfire. Not quite sure that white mark is there on the wing. Next up was a bit of oil wash weathering. So I took some oil paints from Abteilung 502. This is their sepia colour, which is a quite dark brown colour. It was thinned with odourless thinner and applied quite liberally over the surface of the models. I'm not too worried about the excess at this stage because it's easily cleaned up. And the way we do that is to wait for the paint to dry. It can be a few minutes, it can be a bit longer. And then we can wipe it in the direction of airflow using a cotton bud. If it's too dark and a bit too messy, we don't like it, we can dampen that cotton bud in thinner and that will remove a lot of the oil paint. Of course, because you have such a long working time with oil paints, you can go backwards and forwards, adding some, removing some, tidying it up, moving it around, and so on. For some reason, I decided to go quite extreme on the Spitfire, so I absolutely lathered the wings there in oil paint. I did the fuselage later, of course, but I just needed somewhere to hold the aircraft while I did the wings. Again, it's quite a scary stage of modelling because it looks like you've ruined your model. But if we bring in the good old cotton bud, we can remove a lot of that. It's got some nice subtle dark streaks there that run across the wing and they sort of have the effect of blending that brown and that green a bit too, as well as the decals. Of course, you have to be a little bit more circumspect on the undersides because they're a much lighter colour, especially on the Spitfire. So you can see here I have done the wing on our right, which is the part wing, and the one on our left I haven't done yet. And you can just see the subtle difference between the two there. When I was happy with the oil effects, I did a small amount of chipping using the sponge technique and an aluminium paint. I had to be very careful here because, of course, in such a small scale, one of the fibres from the sponge represents a much bigger area on the model, so you can end up with some quite large chips by, uh, by accident. So you have to be very, very careful. As always, it's easier to add more than it is to remove them. I added some here to the propeller. and to the walkway to the cockpit. I haven't shown the 109, but of course I did the same technique on that. Finally, I wanted some aerial wire, so I used this medium black rigging. This is one of those products that you buy once and it lasts forever. Nice and stretchy stuff. I tend to glue one end in place, let the glue set, then stretch it and glue the other end. Usually I include a bit of excess, like here, and then just snip the excess off with a pair of scissors. Finally, it was time to get the two aircraft in position above the ocean, above the English Channel. So here's the terrain I made in my last video. To hold the aircraft up, I use this 2mm clear acrylic rod. 
Unfortunately, you can't see that super clearly there. I drilled a small hole in the bottom of each aircraft, super glued the rod in place, then drilled a hole in the terrain, and I just pushed it in place in the terrain. There's no need to glue it, the terrain base is quite thick, so it will hold it quite nicely. Okay, let's look at the final result. Well guys, that was my build of the Beacon Models Battle of Britain set, the first ever model set that that company has released. I'm really happy that I got in on the ground floor there, supported their Kickstarter campaign and got these kits. To be honest, 1 to 1 4 4 scale is not something that's ever jumped out at me before, but I'm glad I tried these. I think that's a good lesson to myself to try things that, you know, might be a little bit different and a bit outside my comfort zone, because I had a lot of fun with these. After my last video, a few people did say that they wanted to buy the kits, but they were out of stock on the website. I do believe that they are either back in stock now, or they're going to be back in stock very soon. The company has tried really hard to get things out to people, and they've had all kinds of issues of post and all these kind of things with the Royal Mail. Um, so do have a little bit of patience there, guys. They are very, very good in terms of their customer service and keeping people up to date. Um, so yeah, they should... Uh, so yes, if you check out the website now or in the near future, you should be able to see those models again. Talking of models and Spitfires in particular, I haven't forgotten the 124 scale Spitfire. I have been making slow progress on it. Um, part of the reason is I've been out of action for a, a bit recently. And part of the reason is that some of the progress I've made doesn't really make for a particularly exciting video. Uh, there's been lots of sort of dry fitting and sanding and, and, and things like this, but uh, that's that's not that exciting is it but i am making progress the next video won't be the spitfire but the one after that probably will be so if you'd like to see that and you haven't already subscribed then please hit the button below thanks to all of you for watching and thanks to my youtube members and patreon supporters and until the next video have fun modeling <laughs>